Um, and there will be a little bit of Sanskrit, but I'm not going to pretend to understand it. So those of you who do understand it. So this uh, title of the talk actually has a regrettably uh, militaristic history behind it. Uh, uh, just before World War I started, I mean, the day after Britain declared war on Germany, this appeared in the newspaper. I mean, obviously, like all wars, lots of people had been planning for it well before it was actually launched. Your king and country needs you, right? And then a lot of been a lot of variations of this that have happened. You know, you may have seen some of these posters of someone pointing. You know, your country needs you. You know, so I'm not pointing, but your country really needs you, right? Uh, we don't have a war going on right now, thank God. Uh, it's it's just a crisis, right? Um, and it's a pretty big crisis, and I got the chance of a lifetime uh, to sort of see this crisis up front and personal because I was uh, helping with this national education policy. You may be aware that they recently released, uh, you know, it's now in some sort of stage of discussion. Um, and um, just to give you a little bit of uh, background to it, I mean, we've had the, this policy came out after 27 years, right? And it's not the case that our country has been doing fabulously for the last 27 years in terms of education that we didn't need a new policy, right? Uh, we've been desperate for uh, uh, some new directions. Um, so finally, we have something, and now it's going through its various stages, right? I mean, they, they made a committee, then they sort of said, no, 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 we don't really like those results. So then maybe another committee, and that's the one I was helping with. And that committee submitted its report. It was supposed to be before the elections, and it was after the elections, and it happened. Uh, and now something will happen, right? And the majority of the people we have discussed this with uh, are of this view that you know oh, it's great that we have a policy after 27 years but like every other policy before this it's all depends on what will actually get implemented right so it's somebody else's problem thank you thank you for writing this lovely 484 page document uh, but you know and, and it is an exponential growth curve there by the way the 68 policy was I think like eight pages uh, and then the 86, 92 policy was like about 40 something pages. And then this one is 400 pages, right? So, so we say a lot, uh, and then we do something else, right? Um, and the reason I want us to sort of say, this is actually perhaps the worst attitude to have given the fact that we are in a crisis. I think each of us, if we wanted to, uh, can do something really, really meaningful in this space. And so all I want to show you in this talk is a few small examples, right? And what you have been doing over the last few days, I've been chatting to Alas over the uh, uh, tea break, is I think you would have learned a lot of very, very interesting areas. And what I want to show you now is how some of those things could be applied in the context of education. Whether you do this as your lifelong mission or a little project on the side, anything in that space, I think you have a major role to play. Okay, and I'll, I'll reiterate this point later in the talk, but we as computing professionals have a hell of a lot to contribute to many, many things, not just education, right? But we have a lot to contribute. And the reason um, uh, we have a lot is, of course, these, these machines are terribly powerful, right? Uh, they're capable of doing amazing things. And there are many, many people in the rest of the world who don't know how to harness those things. So we're like the, you know, these people who can harness these machines, but we don't necessarily have domain knowledge in a lot of these other places, right? Uh, I, I came back, I, was, I wanted to come uh, for yesterday's events, but I, I, would, I was uh, coming back from a conference abroad, and there I was participating in something related to climate change. And there again, there was the call from the community saying, look, the way you guys, computer scientists, spend so much effort thinking about cool tools to help software developers, let's say, right? So you're coming up with these really cool um, uh, IDEs with these very, very clever extensions that make software productivity so much better. Could you please invest a fraction of that effort in helping climate scientists write climate models better? Because at the end of the day, if governments take decisions based on how they're going to act, it's based on some of these models and their predictions, and there are bugs in that code. I mean, they've, they've been written by uh, software that if we were doing this on the industrial scale, is software going back at least 15 years in terms of its complexity. 
right? We don't have the best tools to write these. I mean, the climate scientists don't have the best tools to write and think about their models. But no computer scientists really, I mean, you go to any top software engineering conference, no one is saying, oh, we'll make, you know, tools for climate scientists. Uh, it's domain specific. Well, so is the other stuff. I mean, that's a domain, right? It's <laughs> software development, it's, you know, it's an industrial scale, it's a domain. Anyway, so what I'm saying here is, hey, please consider some of the problems in, in, um, uh, in education. And <clears throat> there are several opportunities for us, right? I mean, wherever you call yourself a budding computer scientist, or an established computer scientist, or decaying computer scientist, perhaps in my case, right? There's a role for you, right? Um, and if you think, I'm not going to insist that you think this way, this just happens to be the way I think, that I think a better educated India would be much stronger in terms of its response, right? I mean, there are people who have a rather cynical view of education in general. Ha ha, look at some of those so-called educated countries in the West, and they're making even more of a mess than we are, right? Um, and there is a sense to which that is true, um, but I do feel fundamentally where we are and what our problems are, I think if we did have, uh, in general, a stronger, more, better educated India, I think we'd do much better. So in some sense, I feel this is like the bedrock of the crisis. There's a lot of crises. I agree that, you know, the people hungry on the streets, there's, you know, interference in our elections, fake news, blah, 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 I mean, lots of crises, right? Air, water quality, many, many things to worry about, right? But in some sense, I feel this is a major one. Okay, enough of that. Let's talk computer science. What's this? Yeah, yeah, I can read that too. What the hell does it have to do with what I'm saying? <laughs> so, I really like Amda. What is Amda's law? Some formula. Throw the formula out. He'll know what to do with it, right? There's a, there's a really nice sense in which um, uh, I think Amda's law is applicable in the rest of life, right? Um, <clears throat> I had a... a a chance, another chance of a lifetime, I suppose. Certainly it felt like at the time. Now you, you, I wouldn't say it so, uh, so proudly, although I know this is being recorded. Uh, <clears throat> in 2010 and 11, uh, I got a chance to go to uh, Palo Alto and go to Facebook's headquarters, right? Um, and um, because one of my students was working and you know, graduated and went uh, to, uh, to Facebook, and at the time it was so cool, and he said, hey, you know, the Facebook is organizing this uh, academia uh, conference, why don't you come? I said, oh yeah, Facebook, yeah, I'll go. And um, actually that was the time when they also inv invited those same people who eventually made Cambridge Analytica. That was again a welcoming to the academic community, come, 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 you know, that, that happened at that time. 2010, that's when those guys, so, <clears throat> so I had a chance to go there, and, um, and this showed up there, uh, in, in some of those discussions, because at the time, Facebook was growing really, really fast, right? And so one of the engineers was cataloging some of the challenges that were, face, that were facing them, you know. And he said, the way we deal with this is we think about all the challenges, we'll go crazy, right? So this really helps us think about that, right? We think about, of all the challenges that could kill us, which ones will kill us tomorrow? Which ones will kill us three days from now? Which one will kill us a week from now? And then everything else. We'll worry about that when it, when it gets closer, right? right? Um, so one of the things that they were terribly concerned about was, for example, uh, you know, at 8 in the morning, US Eastern Coast time, roughly, the power demand on Facebook servers would shoot up. Why? Huh? There's chocolate, right, for someone who answers? 8 a.m., what happens? Yay! Can I reach you? Oh, one shot. A dive. <laughs> Mega. Anyway, um, so, uh, yeah, US is waking up. First thing everyone's checking is Facebook, right? So they were terribly interested in solving that problem, so they came up with a whole host of approximation algorithms that wouldn't give you the exact news feed update that you needed to, but was good enough and would consume one-tenth the power. So at that time, they'd use the approximation algorithms. Then at 10.30, they could switch to the real algorithm, right? Uh, no one noticed, right? It was good enough, flatten their power demand 
uh, right at that point. So they were looking at the world like this. You know, basically they were taking the view, you know, what is the biggest crisis? Let's tackle the biggest crisis first and biggest factoring in, you know, what is going to kill you first. So I want to take the same approach, uh, looking at the state of education, you know, what's the biggest crisis? And here's just a rough timeline from the time you're born to maybe the time when they stop caring about you, right? I mean, although education goes on forever, right? Um, and, and there's a major, major complicating factor, which I'm going to ignore for this talk, which is the feedback loops, because people graduate and then become teachers. And if you don't have a good education and you become a teacher and you perpetuate the cycle, right? Um, so, um, so I'm going to ignore that for the, for the time being. Let's just focus on the first big one, right? And this happens, I mean, the exact age at time is not so important, but uh, roughly by the age of eight, when you're in class three, or when you were in class three, right? Uh, one of the things that should have happened by that stage uh, is you should have had some foundational amount of literacy and numeracy, right? Um, and I would bet that all of us in this room are extremely fortunate that we did have that fairly well by that age. And you're probably aware that that's not the case for a large, large number of our fellow Indians, right? And this is such, such a major uh, challenge. So I will speak much more about this, right? Uh, I'll just lay out the three challenges that I'm going to talk about here. There are many, many things, right? I mean, 484 pages, we got to a lot of detail, right? Uh, but I'm just going to pick three. So this is one. This is one that you are very familiar with. This is when you finished school and had to write your entrance tests, right? Um, and in an ideal world, what they would be looking for, what any higher education institution would be looking for is, hey, I presume you have basic knowledge and skills, but let me check you on that, right? And your score on your uh, class 12th, is supposed to be reflective of that, but then nobody trusts that or nobody trusts that enough, so then they make you take a JEE or something else, uh, and that's supposed to reflect how good you are at your basic skills. Um, and then there is another word here, which I will describe, I mean, two words, domain propensity, which we shall describe later on, what the hell that means, right? Um, and then the third sort of major uh, point I'll talk about is when you finish, which is soon, Right? And then you go into, most of us go into the world of work, right? And then again, people care about it. And then, and so just, just to distinguish these two, uh, you know, domain propensity is more about, okay, I want to go into, you know, I'm, I want to go into engineering, right? Well, how cut out are you for engineering? Are you really, do you really have a, a, a propensity and an in, inbuilt interest? I'm not talking about the skills. A lot of people have the skills. Are you re do you really want to be an engineer, right? And we all know this because to some extent this is true for probably most of us. It wasn't entirely our decision, right? Uh, do you really want to be an engineer, right? And for many of us, it's not at all our decision. Somebody is making the decision entirely for us. Some of us, we had some amount of interest. Some of us got into engineering and said, actually, we don't have the interest. Uh, and then, you know, that's four torturous years before you decide, hey, actually, that's not, that just shouldn't define you at all. Okay, you got this degree, but you can do a lot of things in the world that are not necessarily related to that. But that's what this is supposed to be about. You know? And then this is like, okay, you finished this degree, presumably now you want a job or whatever, you want to go further in this. Now I really care about how you are going to act. I am going to check you on your knowledge, sure. But I really care about how you're going to approach real problems that we have. So the, I'll talk about that right towards the end. Okay, so let's focus on this, which I think is the biggest one of all, okay? Uh, so, so one thing that, uh, one of the reasons this is big and one of the reasons why a large, large number of people fail to achieve even basic literacy and numeracy, you can imagine the knock-on effects of that, right? I mean, if you don't have basic literacy and numeracy, how the hell are you going to manage the rest of the thing, right? And this is what happens to most of us, uh, most of our Indians is, is, is our, our fellow country when, men and women, they start dropping off from education from this point on. It's a huge drop off from this age because they fail to achieve this, right? And so one of the things that contributes to this is that, you know, 
the commitment from the government only starts from grade one because the right to education only starts from, from this thing. So one of the things the policy said, which is just a stroke of a pen, right? Uh, but it's based on this principle that, hey, you know, kids' brains start developing well b b before this age, right? I mean, it starts developing from here. But a lot of these things probably start much earlier. So one of the stroke of the pen things is just, you know, hey, extend RTE to that point and come up with some basic thing. Okay, all that's fine from the government side, okay? Let's look at it from our side, okay? So I just want to illustrate that this really is the biggest crisis, and then I'll talk about how we respond as computer scientists, because that's what we really care about. So just some words from the policy. It says, at the current time, there is a severe learning crisis in India, where children are enrolled in primary school, but are failing to attain even basic skills, okay? Such as foundation literacy. And then, and they say this on like page 20 or something like that, and they also add this line, which I want to show you. The rest of this policy, which at this point is more than 400 pages to go, will be largely irrelevant unless we do something about this. So this is how big the problem is. Okay? And I'm here to tell you that Baiju's is not offering the solution to this. <laughs> okay? No, just, just in case you thought, hey, isn't this done? I mean, to whatever extent, technology, you know, Baiju's, whatever. I mean, I'm not picking Baiju's as, as uh, I'm using that as because we all know what that represents. It's like Google, you know, everyone, a lot of people do search, but Google does it probably the biggest. Okay, so let's look at where we come in. So there's some invitations in the policy to our community, okay? I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but there's one policy right in the beginning when they're talking about in this chapter on foundational literacy, which is chapter two. Chapter one is just like, hello. Chapter two, here's the big problems. Uh, they start talking about how there's an opportunity, right? We all know that smartphone penetration in this country is not 100%, but it's growing very rapidly. Almost every teacher has one at least, so there's almost one in every class, right? Um, so what can you do, and what can you do to support teachers? And there's lots of issues that, that can be there. Late, much later in the policy, there's even connections with natural language processing, which you've just had some lectures on, right? And I'll just make this one example. So in the context of natural language processing, certain low expertise tasks, such as translating simple sentences, may also be valuable from a pedagogical standpoint. So efforts to teach languages to school students should be dovetailed with efforts to enhance natural language processes for India's diverse languages. And here I will tell you, this is my adding now, this rupee symbol, there's a hell of a lot of money here. So those of you who have an entrepreneurial interest, doing natural language processing in Tulu is of no interest to Google. Right? There's so many languages, but if you can do something really interesting for a subset of languages, and you know, there's a lot of commonality in our languages, so there's a lot of this possibility of reinvesting the effort. Right? You pick enough of a, a, a community, and there are a huge amount of opportunities to build tools around it of very various kinds. Right? I was having a conversation with someone who's involved in making chatbots. And if you can make a chatbot that can reach out to a clientele that doesn't just speak Hindi and English, you're suddenly getting into markets that no one else can tap into. Right? Your, your website is suddenly accessible to a, a group of people who are quite comfortable using the chat interface, but not in one of those two big languages. Right? And here the point is, you know, you need data, and you can connect it because students are learning what is right and wrong. Right? So there are there's some obvious connections here. OK, so I'm going to introduce you to my prop, whose name is Linu. And I will pass Linu around later, if you want. Oh, how nice. Right? So Linu has a special feature, which is up here. Um, if you insert an Android phone into Linu, Linu can play iSpy. Okay, you know the game? Yes, yeah, something beginning with chocolate. Oops. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I reached you. <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, so I spy with my little eye. So you, either you pose a question, I spy with my little something you would see. Some clock, thank you. Right? Uh, or in the seeker role, you ask the question. And then you make her look around, right? Um, and so the Android device will have image recognition, and it will be tuned 
to what you would expect to see in the classroom, because just to sort of improve the accuracy. Um, and um, it will have speech synthesis in an extensible set of Indian languages. So this device can now go in. And the idea is you don't sell the whole toy. You take any toy and you stick the phone in, right? You just need a hole for the camera and a little bit of place, position, careful positioning so that the speaker can, can uh, uh, be heard through all the stuffing, okay? And so that's some simple things, but then they take some inspiration, and here's where the Sanskrit comes in, take some inspiration from the fact that actually in our country we have this wonderful tradition of playing with language, right? And it's something that kids do. If you have ever had a, you don't, I know you don't have a kid, uh, I have a kid, uh, but you, if you have a younger cousin or nephew or niece or something like that, you know, you know it's so much fun. And you know, we've got, as I said, I'll just pick one small example, uh, but there's probably hundreds of this, right? These famous shlokas that, you know, if you read it one way, it's talking about the Ramayan, or if you read it in reverse, it's talking about the Mahabharat, right? I mean, very clever, right? But, I mean, this is one example of this play with language. And playing with language is a wonderful way of learning it, right? Um, <clears throat> I don't speak Kannada, right? Uh, but my daughter, who's now four, is learning Kannada. And so I, little bit that I know, I speak and I make, Tremendous number of mistakes, and she finds it hilarious, you know, uh, the mistakes that I make. I mean, sometimes I make mistakes deliberately, you know, but she just loves the fact that, you know, I got this wrong. So learning through mistakes, learning through slightly, you know, we love punning, you know, Ulas loves punning, go just look outside out here and, you know, you, you, you know how much it, but, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a playful activity, right? So in the spirit of that, but certainly not at the level of uh, that brilliance, a few other things that uh, Linu can do is, uh, you know, I spy something beginning with, right? So for my daughter, for example, she hasn't learned spelling yet, but I can say I spy something beginning with C, and then I'll just give the sound, k k k k k k k and then she'll look around and then she'll see the clock, right? Um, so something like that, or something that rhymes with, or some amount of count, I spy seven pencils, so then she knows what a pencil is, but she has to find seven of them. So you can connect it to a little bit of these kinds of things, right? A few other things that we're working on, which is word bridge and math bridge, right? So just to give you a sense of what those are, word bridges are like, I'll give you two words, sit and stand, and then a sort of like edit distance, you know, of two words. You can add a letter, delete a letter, or modify a letter, but the only problem is the middle, middle words have to all be English words as well, right? So you learn a little bit of spelling, right? Um, math bridge is similar, I give you a starting number and ending number and you're allowed to split in the, the thing into things and do some operations and make it, right? Simple stuff, right? Really, really simple to make, okay? But there's a catch here. And the catch is, this is just a stuffed toy. I haven't done any of this. But do you agree you can do this? Now, what's the problem? If I was a teacher, in primary school, and I thought this was worth doing. I don't have the skills. You have the skills. And you don't have to make money of this. If you want, you can. But what a cool project to work on. What an extensible project to work on. And what a relevant project to work on, right? The challenge is, we can have great ideas as to what to do, Will they actually work in the classroom? Then we'd have to work in partnership with a, with a teacher, right? But one of the things we can do right now, and I'm sure you can see that none of this is technically beyond you. Do you agree with me, right? You can develop this and make it available open source and someone can use it, right? And if you have the time, you can push for it, but at least you can put it out there. And you can certainly put it on your CV, hey, I did this. And I did this in response to this problem that our country is facing. Right? You can certainly enhance your own CV. This, is, this slit happened because my daughter was fighting with her cousin over the toy. That's why this slit happened. Right? And my daughter was so intrigued. Why are you taking my toy to school? She pulled it out. I was about to go for this talk and then suddenly I realized, where the hell is that stuffed toy? And I saw she'd left it on the side under the, she didn't want me to take it, so I have to return it to her now. Excuse me, just a stuffed toy. <laughs> okay, so that's one. Uh, any questions on this? Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. can reveal this, can reveal this thinking process. I have one example that sort of hints at this, uh, that, that, uh-huh, 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 I want to play it. So please tell, give me the link, yeah, yeah, give me the link later, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I think the so as I said, I, I'm certainly very interested in 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 uh, learning more about this game, not least because. This is the kind of stuff I want to introduce my daughter to, and myself. I like playing games too. Um, but I think the, the, you raised an important point here, um, which I just want to flesh out a little bit, which is the connection with the curriculum. Right? I think when we try and do that very explicitly, we lose the magic. Right? Um, the curriculum is a very, very, very deadening thing generally. Right? Uh, and there's so much of interest in the world to explore. And one problem here is that you know the curriculum will evolve at its pace and at the behest of other people, right? Uh, unless you get deeply into the education system, this should not even be of concern to you, right? As I said, I will give you some examples of other tools other computer scientists, science researchers have developed. And at this point, they're not so worried as to whether it can and will be taken up through the formal education system. I think our, our role is to open up the space of possibilities because there are a lot of people out there with really cool education ideas who know much more about education than me. And I'll give you an example because I work with some of them. Right? And of course, it's best if you work in partnership. They know the problems and you can help sort of design something that, that, that fits that, the problem that they have. But at the very least, the kind of work that you have done, right? Taking a game which, whether you yourself realize its educational value or others have, and you have made it available in digital form or some other form, right? This is something that we have as a skill, right? And there is, I, let me promise you, this is not just, everything on this slide is trivial computer science, right? Fairly trivial. I mean, you can now build on these things. This is just a API call, right? So the effort that we, are involved in is, is very limited, right? But there's some real computer science as well. So my next to next example is, is at that um, level. And so there's some really cool research that you can do around this. And as I said, we are unique in, the, in terms of the community to be able to do this, okay? Any other comments before I move to? Thank you for that. Okay, <clears throat> so let's look at the other crisis, which I will call the J.E. et al crisis. Um, so we've all probably gone through this. Certainly I have. I'm, I'm betting most of you have, you know, of this, what is called the shadow education system, right? Uh, our parents have spent a small fortune through private tutoring to help us get through some of these other things, right? So if you look at, you know, uh, hey, India doesn't spend a large fraction of its GDP on education. Yeah, if you just look at the piece the government is spending, it's not as big as some of the other countries. But if you look at how much Indians spend on education, you factor in this, it's pretty impressive, right? And the real shame is what the hell do we learn at the end of it? We learn to crack a test. And that test is just filtering. 
it doesn't basic knowledge and skills chalo okay fine but certainly not this right and actually frankly i don't know how to do this if you if you crack this that's an amazing thing how, how do you figure out if someone is genuinely interested in solving engineering problems right i mean if you look at just i'm not saying we should look at the us for every uh, example but just just as a comparison point of comparison right if you look at sat right if any of you have seen that i mean that's just basic knowledge and skill a little bit of mugging up word lists but that's about it right it's just that it doesn't go deep into something technical right then they look at everything else you know what are your essays what have you done you know that demonstrates that you're super interested in this field right and people go crazy over there you know in the us i mean i had some cousins who were driving their parents mad no we have to go for this i have to learn piano i have to do this and you know so much that they pack and their cv looks enormous wow this person is super interested yeah but the next person has a cv twice as big you know you know so so uh, so you know this is this is a really tough one to do but here you know uh, i'll give you two examples one from sort of earlier not at the je level maybe the middle of this thing and then one maybe that gets closer to the end but still not quite and these are real computer science examples so the first example is some work i did with some colleagues at um, tis so the tata institute of social sciences these these people are actual educators right so you can all answer this question right uh yeah i hope <laughs> yes uh but they were doing these tests with kids in in uh, different parts of the country so this particular one uh, story i'm going to tell you now is from some kids in rajasthan and like most of the kids they interviewed they couldn't recognize the leftmost one as a triangle why patla hai you know it's too thin you know the teacher never draws that right the teacher never draws that and says it's a triangle right so what the kids have learnt are implicitly sort of like what you were saying without really realizing without having this feedback loop they learnt things like squares are always axis parallel because the teacher always draws them on the blackboard like this you you tilt it that's not a square maybe some will say that's a diamond maybe a very small fraction will say it's a rhombus right but just because is tilted means it's not a square because a square is always drawn axis parallel right in fact they were asking some kids you know why is this not a square and the one of the stories they the because they did this field study before we designed the tool one of the kids looks up and the interviewer was a a, a lady looks at her like she's crazy says didi if i write m like this and i turn it upside down it becomes w of course orientation matters I'm like brilliant you know no one told them though that you know it on orientation only applies to letters and digits and things like that but you know this kid has learned that orientation matters so how can you tell me that this is a square and this is also a square it's a different orientation you know but you know revealing that 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 was the problem so once we figured out <coughs> what some of the problems were we went and made a tool and then being good academics we went and wrote a paper about it right but i'm not not going to point you to the paper i'm going to show you the tool because it's kind of cool and and this is an addictive game and don't ask me about the game design that we got someone else to do right uh but the computer science part of it was taking those misconceptions that the educationists had identified and converting them into a question generation tool right so there's a story that goes with this game that there are some aliens who have come to earth it's kind of involved and i won't tell you the all the details but basically um some one of those aliens has committed a crime right so they were trying to also teach a little bit of social good and things like that in general the aliens are nice people but like in every community there's a few people you know who does it. you don't paint the whole everybody just because you know one alien did it it doesn't mean everybody is like that so that kind of thing right so uh, and then the aliens all have some shapes on them that's where the geometry comes it's called police squad so you are the helping the inspector you are the detective or something like that so some suspects are remaining in the first level of this game the system automatically generates some clues that tells you right like the the the, the culprit has at least one obtuse angle so then you have to learn what obtuse is and at least is and things like that in this level you actually have to frame the question yourself so then drop down menus to create a question right and then the robot is the witness and the robot will tell you if it's true or false right or something like that 
and they found this game was extremely exciting, right? And then they've done some follow-up studies after I left the project, uh, which is showing that this has a huge impact in terms of their learning these fundamental things, right? Now, this is a geometric reasoning. This is well beyond fundamentals. So I'm going beyond that fundamental literacy and numeracy. But geometric thinking, again, if you don't have it, then forget about doing anything beyond that. And again, for the sake of form, we do all kinds of advanced geometry beyond this, getting even to the idea of proofs, right? Which is probably the only time in our schooling that we had an inkling of how beautiful a proof could be. And then we kill it by saying, exam may mug up these steps, right? These 14 steps, and then that's your proof, right? And we never bothered to, to you know, appreciate the beauty of proofs. Uh, so this, this uh, is one example of something. And here, as I said, it wasn't very hard from the computer science perspective. But none of those researchers at TIS, despite being all PhDs, with deep ties to the education field, none of them had the computational skills to convert the misconceptions into an automatic generation tool, right? So one of the challenges here was to make sure that you picked a set of shapes so that a reasonable set of queries could narrow it down into exactly one shape, right? And so there was a little bit of a computational problem over there in terms of representation, in terms of search and things like that. But not a very hard uh, problem. Here is a much harder one in terms of you would need much more computer science to, to tackle this. And again, I'll give this as an example. So this is not my work. This is some colleagues from uh, uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, they had written uh, a paper in AAAI, so one of the top AI uh, conferences uh, some years back. Um, so they're saying, hey, you know, later on, they have to learn how to solve problems like that. So this is a textbook problem. You know, show this, prove this, right? And so the problem they're trying to do is, can we automatically generate problems like this? Given an example problem of a certain type, can I generate other proof problems that test similar skills, right? And then the way they tackle this is the whole paper, but basically at a very high level, they take this, convert it into some sort of generalized query, right? And then try and solve for this using some very advanced search techniques, and they're able, there's some parameters in there, and so some, some parameter k equal to seven, they're able to come up with 21 problems of the same type. Right? So you practice, 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 but on the exam you'll see something different. And it won't be out of syllabus. <laughs> so let's not have the riots on the streets, because what we're testing is, do you know the tarika? Have you oiled the tarika rather than just simply me memorized the steps of the proof? Right? And so this forces, if, if the education community is willing to take it, this tool suddenly makes it possible to ask new questions. There is no, oh, but you know, it takes so much effort to come up with a new question, so we'll just copy one from two years ago. Yeah, but then everybody knows you're copying from two years ago, so everyone's mugging up the last five years' papers just to be on the safe side, right? So, I'm sorry? Yes, exactly. And so, this is what I want you to tell you. You have the power to create generative tools. Now, this is only for this problem. But I want to show you that solving that problem is appreciated in the research community. You try writing a paper to this conference, it's really, really hard. But it's appreciated because, I mean, this is at the, at the fundamental part of it was some clever use of uh, AI techniques for a terribly interesting problem. Okay. Uh, Sumit Gulwani's page, if you ever search, it has some very interesting things. I'll show you one more example. This is uh, perhaps in line with what you were saying earlier in terms of revealing. So this is from AAAI 2018, okay? So more recently, this is automatically figuring out student misconceptions. This is really cool, right? Um, so I'm not gonna show you the whole four minute video, which I can't seem to play. Anyway, I, I can't play it, so never mind. Or maybe if I just do this, does that play it? No, that moves to the next slide, okay. So um, basically the idea is I give you some misconceptions that students have. So were you aware of this fact that, you know, subtraction that we learn, right? I mean, there is an algorithm to it, right? 
There is an al algorithm that we learn. But we never learn it as an algorithm. Right? How do we learn it? Yeah, yeah, but we don't do Turing machines in school, right? Uh, when, when, when you learned subtraction in school, how did you learn it? Pingus Pebble 6, those are the mechanics around it. You were taught through examples. No one told you that there are, consider the M digits of the top number in the end, and there's this loop. You know, no one taught you that, right? Take the ith digit of that and the j, you know, and then borrow and then keep, you know, this temp, temp i or something. No one did that, right? But that's what was really going on, right? So it turns out that. When you learn through examples, there's always a risk that the student will learn an incorrect algorithm. We never say the algorithm. We never say, this is it, now just you. You're a human, you're not a computer. So it's not, no point me telling you an algorithm and saying, hey, go do it, right? So we teach through examples. We first do you know, a little bit of simple ones, then without borrowing, then with borrowing, and et cetera. And then we say, tell them, now you know it, go, go do, solve everything. You know, now I should be able to ask you any question on the test, and you should be able to uh, solve it, right? Because you know the algorithm, right? But we never bother to check, do they know the right algorithm? And it turns out, and this was stunning to, for me to find out, there are a hundred, at least a hundred incorrect subtraction algorithms that kids learn. So what this, what this work is trying to say is similarly for, for anything else, addition, multiplication, division, whatever. Can you, from some example problems that the student has worked out, can you figure out the which incorrect algorithm they have in their head? Right? Because what will happen today? The teacher will say, no, no, that's not how you do it. See, you do it this way. But you haven't really changed and you haven't given an example that exposes the student's misconception. Right? Okay, it didn't work on that one. But they'll probably still keep that same algorithm and try it again on the next one. Okay, how am I doing for time? When do I have to stop? No, no, I don't want to stand between. Anyway, so <clears throat> so, so this is, anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming close to, to the finish. So this was the, this paper about trying to figure out misconceptions. So unlike the 100 uh, algorithms the 100 incorrect algorithms for subtraction, which had to be worked out by observing a large number of students and then carefully, you know, whole team of education is trying to figure it out. This is a, uh, an automatic system that you just feed in incorrect examples and out pops a human readable algorithm, right? I would like to have showed you some examples of what it looks like, but uh, somehow the video doesn't seem to be working. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know why, uh, <clears throat> but some very nice, very easy to read representation. So there's a loop and there's an if condition and else, and you can see, oh, that's the problem. They're thinking this. Therefore, give them this one and then show them actually what you, oh, here we go. The video has started. Uh, some, someone talking for four minutes before you get to the actual thing. Um, there was a way to, when I, when I tested it before, there was a way to advance it. But anyway, let it be. Uh, so the way, a way to identify then an exact problem which would expose the misconception, then you can tell them that and it's suddenly much more efficient, right? Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so blah, blah, blah. We'll look at that later. Okay, the last example that I want to do, and this one, I have no idea how to do the hardest part of it, but there are enough companies now that are working in this space. Right? Um, companies are coming uh, that I have interviewed for, for some other work I was doing have told me quite clearly, I don't care about the student's GPA. The student's GPA for me is a zero bit piece of information. He said the, only, the last time I used GPA to make a hiring decision was because I had two candidates and I couldn't tell them apart. So rather than toss a coin, I picked the one with the higher GPA. It's as bad as that, right? So GPA doesn't reflect who you are. Companies are increasingly aware of this, right? So the fight for GPA is not interesting to a lot of people, right? I mean, I know it matters in terms of do, are you at least in that cutoff list before you can go for placement, right? Yes, right? But that last mile fight, you can probably forget it. You're wasting your time, okay? Um, 
but then what companies are doing is then they're sort of, you know, either they themselves are writing, they're giving their own tests, you know, so they, they have their own, you know, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, hacker, earth, hacker, rank kind of thing, you know, so they'll do, you give your own kind of test over there, or uh, they will outsource this to some other companies, right, which, who have developed some, some tools around that. And those tools can do these two pretty well, right? Uh, but I want to give you an example from something like this. And if you can, if you can get NLP techniques to work at the scale that I'm about to show you, this is a human interaction that I'm going to show you, you are very rich and very famous. Okay. Okay. So this uh, uh, example I pulled from a book I read some years ago uh, by a, uh, a Pakistani author who uh, wrote this book called The Reluctant Fundamentalist. Somebody gave this to me. This was a few years before I was uh, returning back from the U.S. after finishing my work over there. And I was thinking, ah, I'll read it, I'll read it, I'll read it. And then finally I said, okay, uh, I'll pack it in my uh, hand luggage and I'll read it on the plane. And then I was thinking... Should I read a book called The Reluctant Fundamentalist on a Plane? You know, if somebody sees me, they'll probably call someone, right? Uh, anyway, so I didn't. I, I read it when I came back, right? Uh, but I want to take out, I didn't much care for the whole book, frankly. Uh, uh, but there's an extract which is amazing, right? Um, so I'm just going to show you the extract. So this is part of an interview. So this was after he graduated, the author, when he graduated and was about to go and work for... I'm trying, going for a job interview. So, so they looked at his CV and all this stuff. This was the sit-down interview, the last stage. So the interviewer said, all right, Changez was the name of the character, fictitious character he got. All right, Changez, let's test you out. I'm going to give you a company that I want you to value. That was his, his skill. He was you know, in, in the business of valuing other companies. You can ask me anything you need to know, and you can do all your calculations with that pencil and paper. The company has only one service line, instantaneous travel. You step into its terminal in New York, and you immediately reappear in London. Okay? That was the interview. How much is this company worth? Okay. And this appears in the book, and it's spread over two pages, so I'm not, I'm not going to show you the whole lot. I'll just give you some highlights from that. Right? So he, then he, was, he responds to that. He's thinking, I would like to think that I was in that moment outwardly calm, but inside I was panicking. How does one value a fictitious, fantastic company such as the one he had just described? Where does one even begin? I had no idea. Right? And then a few more paragraphs about all the state of his stomach and things like that. Then it comes to this part. I started by asking, asking the interviewer questions to understand the technology, how scalable it was, how reliable, how safe. There's one thing you can do it in a lab. How do you actually scale it in real life? So he starts asking the interviewer these questions. Then I asked about the environment, if there were any direct competitors, what the regulators might do, if any suppliers were particularly critical. Then I went to the cost side to figure out what expenses we would have to cover. And last, I looked at revenues, using the Concorde for comparison as an example of the price premium and demand one gets for cutting travel time in half, and then estimating how much more one would get for cutting it to zero. Transatlantic flight, you go in a 747, it takes you so many hours, you go on a Concorde, you pay three times the price, you do it in half the time. When the Concorde used to fly, it doesn't fly anymore. <clears throat> Once I had done all that, I projected profits out into the future, discounted their net present value, and in the end I arrived at a number, $2.3 billion. Now, I don't understand the first thing about finance. But I understand enough to see how he has done all his tarika business, all the steps and the nitty gritty and the algorithm, that comes at the end. There's all this other stuff that comes before that takes such an abstractly posed problem and converts it into an answer. Okay? And what does this tell the interviewer? Much beyond can this guy calculate net present value. Net present value, I can give you a numerical to, to figure out. I mean, if you knew how, knew how the formula is, just plug it in and tuck, 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 tuck. But who the hell cares about that? The computers who can do it much more accurately than you, right? In this case, he was deliberately asked to do it on paper and pen, pencil, but that's just because of the environment of the interview. In any real scenario, no one would be foolish enough to do that calculation by paper and pencil. Yet, what do we do? We insist on learning how to solve things. Dijkstra's algorithm on a graph, show me the path, right? Who the hell cares, right? Well, 
only to the extent I want to care about do you know the, the algorithm, right? And I don't want to ask you the algorithm because that you will ratify and repeat it, right? So how do you test something that goes beyond simple things? How, I'm just giving you this as an example of how complex this could be. And this is why you might pay someone to go and conduct interviews because that's, that's a working professional who's asking this. That's a whole day's job, right? So it has to be this worth it. And if you can find a way to automate that and do this over Skype, you're very rich. And I would argue you have made a huge, huge advance. You have forced now education to be something much more than, than what we are doing right now. Because as I said, today it's all about what's your GPA right? as a proxy to something, to some representation of knowledge that you have, some, some representation of competence that you have. Right? Not every company will do this, right? but there are going to be increasingly opportunities for companies to, to be this picky. Because a lot of the low level stuff, you know, thanks to all the other stuff that was written in that whiteboard and thanks to some of the other technologies you have seen in the last few days, you are probably well aware that there are, in the job market, there are increasingly jobs at severe risk. In the policy, we talked about this also. And we said, look, if we have a chalta uh, hai kind of education system, then we're going to have more riots on the street than we have now, now because no one's going to be prepared for this. So this is why I said at the start, I think this isn't a, a crisis. This is a crisis that we can do something very meaningful in terms of addressing, even if it is to the point of adding to the pool of options that are out there, even if it is for some of these very toy things that we have done. Right? I think this is something that we as computer scientists can contribute to. You may find it very rewarding, you may not. Right? But I think at this point, I just wanted to put it in your mind. I didn't want to give you a technical talk. I wanted to put it in your mind. There are a host of tools that you have. There's a host of challenges. Right? If any of this sounded intriguing and interesting and you want to have a further discussion, I would love to have that discussion with you. Questions, yeah. Here's how you get around. Here's how you get around the formal system, right? You just just hear me out. Just hear me. No, just hear me out. Just there is. I agree with you fundamentally where you're going from. That that the schooling system will put barriers to you. Who the hell are you, right? Who you know? Literally, who the hell are you, right? Uh, so look at it from the perspective of uh, parents. Parents care deeply about the education of their kids to the extent that they're going to pay a lot of their money for that, right? So today, what does a company, I'll go back to Baiju's, but just, just as an illustrative example, what does a company like Baiju's do? It says, hey, parent, pay for this. Shah Rukh Khan has endorsed the fact that, you know, your kid will study sitting on this thing and, you know, all these fancy things will happen and learning will happen, right? And by the way, we also have this official blessing that it's tied to the curriculum, right? And that today is the big, big selling point. It's official. It is tied to the curriculum, right? Um, what I'm saying is that part of it, you know, you need to be a Baiju's kind of thing to, to sort of get that level of endorsement, right? Increasingly, there are enough number of parents. I'm certainly one of them, but there are an increasing number of parents who recognize that that is serving a very, very vestigial purpose. It's not the main, that's not where learning is happening. That is just the chop. That is just the passport to do the next thing. Right? But that's not where the learning is happening. So you work on tools that genuinely advance learning in some sense. That is, of course, somewhere connected to the curriculum, but it doesn't necessarily have to have the endorsement. And my point here is there's a large number of people who can access these tools outside the schooling system. A lot of, a lot of large number of people do, right? A large number of people take their kids for other kinds of skill building or, you know, whatever it is, you know, dance class, this class, whatever it is, you know, there's a lot of other things that go around, 
that, that the parents are quite willing to pay for because they recognize that there is value and the school doesn't provide enough, the formal curriculum doesn't provide enough. So this is adding to that. It is working in that space, right? And as I said, if you can, if you can, um, even if you don't go any further than say, I'm, I'm going to make my uh, business out of this or a, you know, this, uh, you know, a philanthropic effort out of this, even if you don't go to that extent, but you just explore it using your technical skills. My point here is just for all of us here, there are some terribly interesting computer science problems in this space, right? And so even if you go no further than, hey, I worked on this project, which happens to have a very important application, I didn't go and take it any further. But even if you just took it there, you would have a lot of uh, value add that you would have done. Right? I agree with you that getting official buy-in is very, very hard. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, 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 I agree, I agree with you. Uh, and again, as I said, I think if, if this is something that you are, you feel passionately enough about, and maybe, maybe not now, but maybe after you have worked a few years and you know, you, you, you are financially, uh, you know, stable and you feel, okay, I, I have some time. I do know a lot of uh, professionals who are investing in their time and efforts in, in this space, which I think is wonderful. And again, I think this, Yes, this can add to this. But what I'm saying is, you are bringing a set of skills that very few other people can bring, right? Um, and that is all I would like you to take away from this talk. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that is something that I'm currently working on. So uh, I currently have a uh, visiting position uh, here at the institution. Uh, I'm hoping that at some point it will be a little bit more permanent. But this is one of the things that I have in the pipeline uh, to do uh, at, at that point. So that's not an excuse. It's not a cop out. Uh, my, I have a, a some amount of time that I have to devote to, as I said, making sure that I have a position uh, going forward. Once that, if that happens, uh, I have some very concrete plans in that space, right? And I recognize, so as I said, I was a, I was a consultant to this process, but there's a, a few lines in there that were written on that laptop, right? A few lines in the policy that were written on that laptop. And it survived the editing process, so those electrons were contributed by me. <laughs> and that, there, is, there are some lines uh, uh, in that direction as well, in terms of the, the, the vast amount of resources that students like you have in terms of interest and time. And what you are gasping for is some real problems, right? And so connecting the real problems to this requires essentially a Google Summer of Code-like platform, right? But for educational challenges or climate change challenges or whatever it is, right? So exactly those te that terminology is what I'm trying to work on, you know, can we have a, you know, GSOC-like platform, but focused on some of these things. So thank you for raising that, but that's very much on my agenda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
So here's something you can all do. Be wiser parents. Yeah? I mean, you, make a, you make a huge difference there in that space. Yeah? When you become parents, be wiser parents. It's tough. I prom the peer pressure is so intense. What did you get? How many marks You know, it's huge. You, you, you're, you're fully aware of that. But as I said, there is, there is certainly a case uh, to be made for for greater wisdom and it's 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 a challenge and i agree with you that to some extent this is a problem of lack of awareness of some of these things and you know you just take the lazy option in in some cases go ahead mm -hmm. Right. So as I said, this become this proxy that, you know, the curriculum is God and the score is uber God, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, so it's uh, unfortunate, you know, this number represents, you know, what, what you are. I mean, there's this tragic story about the suicides in Telangana because of some, you know, uh, error in the um, scoring. The, the score represents who you are, you know, and that's, of course, taking it to a, to a very tragic extreme. But th there is this very deep set mentality, you know. Um, I, I, I'll tell you a nice story. So my 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 wife, uh, when she finished her uh, schooling, you know, had, was repelled by this oh rat race, you know, and because she, in her case also the cousins who were very bright, and he got into JE and this this this, you know. So she's like, I don't want to do any of this. I uh, she went and did a diploma, right? And as you are aware. If you do a diploma, then your chances of going for higher studies uh, are, are very, very limited. And by the way, so she's a, a researcher at a sister institute now, right? But she had a diploma at the time. And then for a few years, she had no options in our education system. And quite by accident, she met uh, someone who became a great mentor to her. Uh, and he was like 50, 60 years older than her and uh, asked, so what are you studying? And she looked at him and said, I'm done with studying. He said, I'm 50 years older than you. I'm not done with studying. How come, you can, how come you're done with studying? You know, in this idea that studying is what happens in that, those four walls and anything outside that is not studying. And you, know, you ask a kid, where are you going? I'm going to study. And they've got this glum face and a bag of books. You know, that, that's studying. You know? But going out and saying, you know, where is that sound coming from? Was that a cricket or is that something else? That's not studying. You know? uh, we have this you know, unfortunate... Uh, view of the world that studying is what happens in books and the curriculum and there's, you know. Anyway, as I said, you have a, a, a powerful opportunity to take the knowledge that you have, the skills that you have, and apply them to problems that are of great interest to the world, right? Try and do some of that at least. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And any other questions? I'll stay back for a bit. Then I have to go fetch this famous daughter of mine. Okay. Thank you.